This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Would you open your Bibles with me to the book of Leviticus today? Leviticus 24, verse 1 to 4 is our text. Leviticus 24. We're in this series of God's tabernacle in me. We are learning and traveling through the tabernacle that God has given to his people. And we are praying and we're asking the Lord to build his tabernacle, build his temple, build his church in us. So that we may be what God has called us to be. Leviticus 24, 1-4. Amen. If you have found it, please say Christ-likeness. And if you would rise with me as I read God's word this morning. Leviticus 24, verse 1 to 4. The Lord said to Moses, Command the Israelites to bring you clear oil pressed of pressed olives for the light, so that the lamps may be kept burning continually. Outside the curtain of the testimony, in the tent of meeting, Aaron is to tend the lamps before the Lord from evening till morning continually. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. The lamps on the pure gold lampstand before the Lord must be tended continually. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may take your seats. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name, asking the Spirit of the living God to illuminate our hearts, to receive your truth to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, with a show of hands, how many of you have ever made a pe paper airplane? A paper airplane, anyone? Okay, great, great. So when you made the paper airplane, uh, did you just fold it up, make it look nice, and just put it on the table, and then you just watched it? You examined it from this angle, and from this angle, you're like, hmm, that's a pretty nice-looking paper plane. What did you do with the paper plane? Well, I would suggest most of us probably would have tested it out. So you would have probably gone like this or, or like this, and some of it would have gone up, some of it would have gone down, and you'd be like, oh, well, I need to make some adjustments so that it can glide through the air as it's supposed to do. The paper airplane is not just to sit, look pretty on the table. It is supposed to do what? It's supposed to fly. Exactly, exactly. Now, what if our spiritual lives, we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we say we believe in him, and then we just put it nicely on the table. And then we look at it. Oh, that's a nice-looking faith right there. Oh, yes, and this aspect looks really, really nice. See, the Bible teaches us that our faith needs testing. Our faith needs testing to see if it's going to fly high or really just kind of crash down. We've been talking a lot about our perception of our faith and the reality of our faith. We may think that the faith that we have is such a glorious, wonderful, beautiful, perfected faith. And yet, the reality of it, when it hits hard times, when it is tested, it might fall to the ground. And we find out our perception of our faith was not in match with the reality of our faith. Faith that is not tested could be a sitting airplane that never experiences the freedom of gliding through the air. And God's word talks a lot about the testing of our faith. Let me bring you back to Genesis, Genesis 22, verse 1 and 2. I'll read for you. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham. God did what? tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am, he said. Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Okay, God commands, so Abraham obeys, but you need to understand the context that Isaac is, is the son of what? Promise that will have more sons and daughters, generations and generations. And God says, uh, you need to give up that son. Sacrifice your son. The writer of Hebrews uh, interprets this text in this way in Hebrews 11, verse 17 to 19. By faith. By what? 
By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead and so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. This faith that Abraham possessed was tested by God himself, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Now, we all want to see our paper airplanes fly and glide through the air, no? We want to see it go far, and sometimes we'll have friends and we'll stand on the same line and say, listen, the winner is going to be the one who flies their airplane the furthest. All of us want to have a faith that will stand the test of time or stand the test that God gives us. The problem is, when testing comes, most of us, or even many of us, will feel like we're on we're being attacked more than being tested. Now, God loves us, and he has a perfect plan for our lives, and he will not attack us. Amen? God is for us, and God lovingly will test us. In other words, God will lovingly discipline us through various circumstances to see and to check if our faith is real. If our faith is really embedded in the truth of God's word, what we say and what we do and how we think and how we speak all align to the truth of God's word. There are many Christians today, self-professing ones, that when their faith is tested, their faith is known to fall flat rather than fly high. If I said to you, black water is Coca-Cola, that would be a lie. Just like transparent, fizzy water is Sprite, that would be a lie too. See, when we say we have faith in God, it must be backed up by what? Living. It must be backed up with a character that supports the faith we have in God. And that can only be done by aligning our perception and our reality aligned with the cross of Jesus Christ, saying, Lord, I cannot live this life that you're calling me to. Be holy, for I am holy, God says. I can't do that, Lord, but by the power of your Spirit, as I submit to the power of the cross and to the power of our resurrected Savior, Lord, I know you are able. I am weak, but you are strong. There's even a song about it. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Question, is Jesus our all in all today? There are so-called Christians that must have it their way than obey God's way. They will have it their way only and refuse Yahweh's way. There are so-called Christians who refuse to be refined by fire, but wants to refine God with their witty ideas. God, I, I think you missed a point. I think you have a blind spot, God. So let me point that out to you. See, you refining me in the fire seems a little bit harsh, so let me refine you. And that was an amen. <laughs> a so-called Christian will jump out of the fire and give excuses about how others are more suited for refinement than themselves. Listen, God, this refinement thing, Mr. Jones, he's more suited for it. So how about he has the refinement and I get all the blessings? And you think that's crazy. But there are many Christians who think, well, this message is for my husband. It's not for me. I've heard many a times, I, I greet people on their way out, and uh, our church family, you are so kind. You say, great message, Pastor. Uh, I'm going to send that YouTube link to uh, a cousin who needs to hear it. And I think in my heart, God bless you, thank you, thank you, thank you for listening, but perhaps God is speaking to you as well. Amen? Amen. 
He's speaking to us today through his word. Now, I've given you a a very long introduction as we go into the tabernacle because I, I think it's important that we begin to think about, okay, is my faith real in the eyes of the Lord, not just in the eyes of men? Because you can fool people, but the reality is we can never fool God. God knows exactly your motives. God knows exactly your intentions. God knows your heart. And for us here at DCN, we don't need to worry about that. We're blessed that God knows our hearts because we do things for the Lord without acclamation from people. Hallelujah and amen. We give to the Lord. We serve to the Lord. We fellowship. We evangelize. And we do it unto the Lord as we're supposed to. But there are some. I'm just... I'm not trying to discourage anyone, but there are some people in the Christian world that they will not do it if they don't get a a, a ribbon. I need my ribbon, pastor. I, I need a pat on the back, and I would love to give you a pat on the back and encourage you. That's my role. But again, I'm not God, neither are you. But God sees what you do behind the scenes, and we give praise, because on that day of judgment, he will reward us. Amen? For everything done unto him. So today, we go to the menorah. And again, I want to thank Benny for uh, giving us this menorah from Israel. Uh, And uh, I'm just so grateful that we have people uh, that come from the Holy Land. And I've been to the Holy Land twice myself. And every time I'm there, I I can just see the the words of the Bible just jump up. And I, I can see, you know, imagine with my holy imagination, Jesus walking, Jesus preaching, Jesus ministering, Jesus healing, Jesus saving, Jesus dying, Jesus rising. Hallelujah. And the menorah uh, is the center point of our message today because we are called to be stewards of the light. Stewards of the light. See, today in Leviticus, God commands Aaron to tend to the light. Now, the tending of the light is caring for the light. So trimming the wicks, as it were, and being able to um, just uh, care and manage the light in such a way that it will burn perpetually. It will burn continually. That is the job of the priest. Aaron and his descendants are to tend to the light, to the menorah, to the golden lampstand, to the golden lampstand. And we all know uh, that the golden lampstand shines brightly inside the tabernacle, for the tabernacle has no windows. Amen? It didn't have any LED lights. Okay? So the light from the menorah shines brightly onto the table of showbread, shines brightly onto the altar of incense, and it shines brightly God's light. Why? The fire comes from the brazen altar, and the priests bring it to light this light of the golden lampstand, but it doesn't just burn on its own. It's, it burns with the pure, pure olive oil that they brought, and, and that's the oil of the Holy Spirit that gives it light. That is the source. Holy Spirit anointing oil. Okay, you understand that? And then there's a wick, and then the light is Jesus Christ. And I've told you that the wick represents us, the Christian. We are the wick, Holy Spirit is the anointing oil, the power source, as it were, and then it goes through that wick, and if it is trimmed well, you'll see the light, and you won't see the wick. That's the beauty of a Christian. What we do, we do for the Lord under the power of the Holy Spirit, and our names don't need to get recognized. A couple of years ago, our church sent a missions team to Haiti, And our prayer uh, during the trip, Pastor Alan prayed this a lot. Pastor Alan prayed, Lord, may they all remember Jesus. They don't need to remember us. They don't need to remember Pastor Alan or or they don't need to remember Daryl. They don't need to remember Larry. May they remember Jesus. And that is a Christian that is burning at full combustion, most effectively for the Lord Jesus Christ. When we burn for the Lord, ourself must be hidden with God's light. Amen? Ourselves don't need to be recognized. Oh, look at me. Is anyone? I'm going to do something nice, everyone. Okay, I'm just giving you a forewarning. I'm going to do something. Get your cameras out, Instagram, you know, TikTok. Uh, uh, So I'm going to do something nice. Film me. It's not about that. It's about Jesus. Even if you don't get recognized by the world, if you are recognized by God, amen and hallelujah. Praise God. Job done. Exactly. 
Yeah, and that's who we are. But why does that wick need to be tended every day? Because there's something called a sin nature in us that wants to come up and say, look at me. Can you imagine that wick, you know, getting so long and and it's becoming kind of brighter and brighter. And so the wick kind of has its own ego, right? Self-absorbedness and be like, oh, look at that. That's a nice bright light. And imagine that wick growing, growing, growing. And then what needs to happen? Because we are the royalty and the priesthood of God, we have the authority and the power to trim that wick because pride is detestable unto the Lord. We must never say, oh, look at me. How great am I, right? We sing that song, how great is our God, right? How great is our, he is great. We never sing, how great is me. How, that's terrible. I'm not great. God in me, Christ in me, the hope of glory. And Jesus shines through his body, his church, his temple, his tabernacle. We are called to trim those wicks, not weekly, not monthly, not bi-weekly, not annually, every day. Every day we trim it through the word of God. Lord, help me to see if there's any wick that's growing that it should not be growing. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. And sometimes when we fail to trim our wicks, God in his kindness will come and test our faith and trim those wicks for cleansing and purification. As I mentioned before, if you love your children, you will discipline them. Can I get an amen? Yeah. If you love them, and when they are grown, they'll say, thank you so much. If it wasn't for that discipline, I wouldn't be where I am today. Now, for some kids, they need a little bit longer for that to happen. So even if they're still 55, they're still learning, still growing. Pray for them. Amen. Okay. Give them patience. Give them kindness. Fruit of the Spirit. But God disciplines those whom he loves. And in 1 Peter 1.7, we read this. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. James writes it like this, James 1, 2 to 4. Count it all joy my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The testing and the trials that God brings us is not to defeat you, is not to bring you calamity. It's actually to raise you up to be purified, refined by fire. And when God refines us, we might feel the heat. Literally. We might feel the heat from our family members saying, oh my goodness, you're getting too gung-ho in your faith. Just slow down a little bit. Your friends at work might begin to kind of ostracize you and push you away. The people that, you know, called friends may unfriend you. But I keep on saying this, and I believe it's worthy to be repeated. Although we may not be famous in the world, if we are famous in God's eyes, that's it. Even if we are not recognized by the world, if God says, you are mine, that's it. For God to say to you, you are my daughter, You are my son, and in you I am well pleased. You are mine. I will not let you go. I love you, son. I love you, daughter. And because I love you, I will test you with the fire, the refiner's fire, and I will let you have these experiences, sometimes mountaintop experiences, sometimes the valley experiences. But nonetheless, our God is with us. 
And so if God is for us, who can stand against us? You don't need to worry about the people who persecute you, the people who continue to misconstrue the truth against you. Pray for them. And when you pray for them, God will give you the heart to bless them. And God will give you the heart to have compassion over them and say, Lord, forgive them, for they do not know what they do, following the prayer of Jesus who prayed on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. So if we do not trim the wicks, God in his mercy will let the great high priest, Jesus Christ, come and trim that wick so that his glorious light may shine. The trying of our faith, the testing of our faith should be a joy for us today, friends. Because there are many people who profess their faith and live their whole lives with a false faith, with a bad faith, only lying to themselves and thinking that they've outwitted God. But at the end of the day, we need a faith that stands tall when the fire comes, when the rain comes, when the hailstorm comes, when the snow comes, whatever comes our way, we must be grounded in God's word, in God's truth. That is what God wants for us. That is purity. That is good faith. That is wholesome faith. When you are loved, God will test you. Sometimes couples... Uh, married couples, yeah, I'm, I'm referring to, uh, will we'll try to say, oh, do you love me? Or don't you love me? Can you help me understand how you love me more, you know? And, and then, you know, can you do this for me? Oh, that's so nice. Can you do that for me? Yeah, and there's a, a relationship that builds up. I'm talking about a covenant relationship. For God is not looking for robotics, we will obey your word, you know. Oh, master, you know. You know he's not looking. Oh, look at me doing the robotics, you know. <laughs> he's not looking for robots. He's looking for people, for relationship. He loves you with an everlasting love, and he knows you from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. He knows you. He wants to bless you, and he has a purpose for your life and mine. And he wants that faith that we profess to be pure so that we may shine like the menorah shines in the tabernacle. That's God's desire. And by the way, when the wick is burning in full combustion with the oil and with the light, guess what? It's fulfilling its purpose. So let me ask you, what is your purpose in this life? Is it just to exist? Well, I'm just breathing, Pastor. So I'm, I'm just, as long as I have breath, I'm just breathing. Well, praise the Lord, you're breathing. But you've got to do something with the breath God's given you, no? I mean, you guys thought I was crazy when I said uh, we're going to fold up the pep air paper plane, right? Air paper plane, and put it on the table and just, just look at it from this angle and look at it from this angle. You're like, no, that's not the purpose. Perhaps God sees you as this wonderful masterpiece of a paper airplane. And you're not willing to get off the table. When God tests you, he will thrust you forward. And he will carry you, if your faith is true, with the wind of the Holy Spirit. Empowering you to overcome certain circumstances, even difficult times. You will go through it with the grace and the power and the peace of God. And when we face those times of testing, we must say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, because somehow maybe I've missed the trimming of my wick and you're helping me to come in alignment to full combustion. Full combustion. Can we be honest with ourselves this morning and stop pretending uh, can I just give you a little bit of advice? Uh, is, is it okay, uh, Wagner? Yeah, praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, okay, gloria a Dios. Okay, gloria a Dios. 
faking it till you make it does not work. And on the side, it's no fun either. Because you have to exert so much energy to become somebody that you're not. But when you step in alignment with God's will, guess what? Because you're being glided and pushed with the wind of the Holy Ghost, everything is so peaceful and you understand that God has a plan. Perhaps you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but you trust in the one who does. Praise God. It happened to me this week. Uh, my, my son Leo has been suffering from stomach pain for a long, long time, uh, since May actually. And the doctors can't figure out what's going on. Of course, mom and dad are praying and other people are praying. Uh, and, but finally, Friday night, he's like, I can't stand this no more. So we, we rush him to the ER. And uh, he's there and I'm with him. Mom's at home praying with CJ. Uh, and, and they do some tests and, and they're about to release him because he's, you know, after a little while, he's fine. But then it's like when your car breaks down. Have you ever experienced, when you take it to the mechanic, it's suddenly not broken. <laughs> it happened with my son. I take him to the doctors. He's not broken. He's like, Dad, I'm fine. So they watch him and bless their hearts for, you know, giving him time to monitor, like five, six hours. And then after five, six hours, he's in excruciating pain again, like rolling on that bed. And I'm like, okay, guys, come on in. This is what's going on. This is exactly what's going on. And so uh, they're, they're treating him, and, and, and I'm sitting there in the emergency room thanking God that, yes, we're praying and we believe in the power of healing. Can I get an amen? amen. God still delivers. God still saves. and He has the power. But I also believe God works through the, the doctors and nurses whom God has given the wisdom to. Praise the Lord. I mean, I, yeah, I don't need to go into that. So <laughs> praise the Lord. For his healing. And I'm grateful that God is ministering to my son through the help of the doctors and nurses and medicine and whatnot. And I'm just praising him. Yes, of course, my heart aches when my son is in pain. Of course. Of course. And yet, Lord, I know that you're testing my faith in this hour. And I thank you. And guess what? I found a little bit more of the father's heart through this trial. That when they came to do blood work for my son, Leo, and no seven-year-old likes needles, right? I mean, I'm 40 years old, and I still... Anyone like needles? Anyways, besides the point. And he's like shuddering and shaking. No, don't do this. Don't do this. And they're holding him. And I, 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 and I turn his head away. Leo, you don't need to look at that. And they're putting that, that into him. Something in me just shifted. And I thought about the nails going into Jesus' hands and feet. And I thought about the Father's heart. And it moved me. That God would express his love to us through his one and only begotten Son. And as God witnessed the nails going through his son's hands and his feet. What was going through God the Father's heart? It was a divine moment. But what if I was so fixated on God? Why are you letting this happen? Why is my son sick? I'm a preacher of healing and deliverance and salvation, yet my son's sick. What, what if I was in that mode? Self-absorbedness. Ego. But the Lord showed kindness to me in tenderizing my heart and put me on a different level of understanding and trusting, and I still trust God for healing. He's doing that right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I believe. But maybe the healing is not just for my son's body. Maybe it's the healing for me to understand the father's heart. And through testing, my perception of my faith and the reality of my faith is coming together. So when God tests your faith, let's take a step back and ask God to teach us the bigger picture 
the grand plan of redemption and salvation that God has for us. And to learn those lessons that God has for us with a tender heart, with a humble heart with a heart that will receive and accept whatever God has for me, it is good. Why? He is. And he wants us to shine brightly for his kingdom. Hebrews 12, verse 1 to 3 reads this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. I see all the things that entangles us and the sin, that is the outgrown wick that needs to be tended to, cut off every single day. It's like the gardener in John 15 too. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it'll be even more fruitful. In other words, even more brighter. In other words, even more gloriously br brightly shining for him, my king, my liege, my lord, my savior. He must become greater. We must become less so that he burns brightly. And guess what? When we burn brightly for the Lord as the church here in Danvers, watch out North Shore. Revival, fire will sweep through this area that is missionally unchurched. This is a mission field. And when we trim our wicks every day, in accordance with the word and through prayer, in accordance with what God has for us, I'm believing that we're going to see some marvelous salvations, healings, deliverances, miracles of God's grace flowing through this church body. And I'm praying for that to happen in our day, Lord. And if it doesn't happen in our day, praise the Lord, we're investing in the next generation to carry on that torch. So I'm good either way. I'm on the winning team. You're on the winning team. God is victorious, but we need to do our part. And when Jesus, our great high priest, comes to trim our wicks, let us do so with a heart that is humble to receive and not ask the question of why. Why is this happening? Why won't this happen? But we ask the question of who. You are with me. Thank you, Lord. Even though I don't see it, you are working. Even though I don't feel it, you are working. God is working all around us. He doesn't stop working. And that's why he is way maker. What's the next one? Miracle worker. Promise keeper. Light in the darkness, right? That's our God. So why do we need to fear? Why do we need to worry? Why do we need to be depressed and defeated? We say no in the name of Jesus. As the stewards of God's light, we say yes to his plans. And by the way, when we surrender to his plans, we will have peace, joy. We will have the energy to run and run for Jesus. And we will see God's beauty and glory be revealed. Hallelujah and amen. Let us pray. The worship team can come and join us. Father, we pray in Jesus' name that our faith be made pure in your eyes. Not acceptable in our own eyes, but acceptable in your eyes. And Lord, you have given us the standard through your word and by your spirit, you are illuminating our hearts towards Christ-likeness to become the church that you have always planned for us to be. So Lord, we ask of you to fill us anew. We ask of you to help us see the reality of our faith today. And if there are areas in our lives that need adjusting, trimming, tending, cutting away, pruning. Lord, may we do so with gladness, knowing that our Father 
knows best. And Lord, we want to pray that you would use this body for your glory. That we would see more lives be transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we would be a disciple-making church. And that we would send people out into the nations. Lord, there are many souls dying right now, not knowing who you are. Help us to be the beacons of light. And may we do that well as the stewards of your light. We love and honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.